Hi, and welcome to the Poultry Keepers podcast. I'm Mandolin Royal, and I'm here together with Rip Stalvey and John Gunterman, and we're your co-hosts for this show. And it's our mission to help you have happy, healthy, and a productive flock. We're going to be talking about some pretty tasteful options for your flock. Because did you know that one way to call your birds is to invite them to the dinner table? Just ahead, we're going to talk about how eating your birds is a tasty calling incentive. How do you identify your cull hens? And what, what's your criteria? Well, for me, it varies based on their age and what I'm shopping through. So, for example, if I have 40 pellets coming up on point of lay. I'm looking for early matures that start laying too soon. Those are a call for me because they're probably not going to make weight. There's a bit of a balancing act there between getting started when they should. Average for chickens, I'd say that's about 22, 24 weeks old. But some of mine want to get started at 18 weeks and I need them to be five pounds if they're going to do that. Chances are at 18 weeks, they're not going to make the threshold for weight. But then as they go through their laying, I'm looking at the regularity, the time of day, when their egg size comes up. And so out of the original group, that list of keepers will systematically get shorter and shorter as time goes on. And I keep that selection pressure on them all the way until two years old, waiting on those prime hatching eggs that come from the older year and a half, two year old birds because they've survived everything they needed to survive. And they were also excellent producers over their first year of active laying. That's when you get into the good stuff. They've proven themselves. Yeah. And And there's a couple of good toll gates in there. But cull doesn't necessarily mean kill. I mean, early layers you could sell off to a backyard flock. They'd be perfectly serviceable for folks like that. So I like those birds. If they leave the farm, I want them to go to where there is not a male in residence. I'd prefer that they go to the urban flocks where they're not going to be hatching or breeding from those birds that I called out. Let me throw this out there. Don't, and I, I may be all wet here and it won't be the first time in my life, but to me, a lot of culling depends on what my flock goals are and, and they can, they can vary from year to year with me. I, I may be wanting to focus on improved body length one year. And and then so I'm, my culling decisions are based on the birds that meet the general requirements, and, and we'll get into those in a little bit, but also the specific of my birds that I'm working with. Yeah, that's true. I had to think back through a lot of hindsight that I've gained, and I did have a bad habit of trying to select for too much at one time. And you got to kind of slow it down a little bit. Oh, it'll kill you. You know, if if you try to correct more than one, maybe two things a year, you're setting yourself up for failure right off the bat. That's probably how I've almost called myself out of a flock twice now. (laughs) That'll do it. Let's talk about uh, what are some of the outward visual cues we can get from our birds that say, hey, this might be a bird that I want to pass on for this year. For me, it's anything that lacks condition or fleshing. But that's because we're a table. F- I'm looking for the birds that jump down off the roost and actually run past the feeder in the morning and go out and start foraging on their own. Range ability is important, too. That really speaks to vigor to me. Uh, those birds who lack vigor are not going to be the ones doing that. At least not in my experience. No. And also, no, just looking, watching them, observing my birds. If I have four or five birds out in the field just plucking around and say one of them has kind of a dirty vent and I have to wash it more than once in her lifetime, you know, and everybody else and everybody else doesn't have that same problem. You know, for some reason, I maybe don't want those genes around. Yeah. Yeah. Any bird that needs extra anything. They tend to drop out of selection as well here because you don't want to have a a needy 
flock that needs to have, what do some people do? They do like twice yearly blanket warmings to prevent some poopy butts. Yeah. Or they'll blanket treat for coccidia, the entire flock. And you got to stay away from that blanket treatment. I want birds that, and the, the word is sustainable. They're, they don't depend on me to breed forward true and healthy and be vigorous. They, they could potentially go three or four years without any human intervention if they needed to. My grandmother had a 12-year-old hen that was still laying these teeny tiny little robin's egg size eggs. But at 12 years old, she was still laying them. <laughs> and I bet you those genetics, I mean, they're certainly not going to change that are in there. Getting it fertilized is another thing. Yeah, when that hen was two or three years old, that would have been prime breeding for her, for that individual bird. And looking at it on the individual basis and then lumping it into the flock averages, getting to where you have consistent data to know what's happening in the big picture, but then the small picture of each individual too, that seems to make a pretty good difference. Well, I think a lot of it is knowing your flock and you're always comparing your birds against themselves, not against other people's birds and birds in magazines. You've got your standard of perfection and you've got your goals in mind. And when I look out at a group of a dozen hens, I can go, no, no, yes, yes, definitely, maybe, you know, especially if I'm handling them a lot. Um, you know, you're, the way you describe the fleshing elements is great. So I'm going to throw you under the bus for that. <laughs> well, when you get your hands on them, they ought to feel like a good meaty, oh, I could I, eat this bird I, sort of. I pick it. them up and I go, you're a chunker or you're not. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to have fun taking you apart to cook or serve or no. Now on our so little For, for me, that pelvic here. structure is huge because I have big hands and I have to wear you know, rubber gloves when I'm processing and I'm tired of cutting gloves and I'm tired of cutting my hands when I'm eviscerating. So I'm naturally going to select for that body cavity spacing between those bones. Yeah, that's a very important aspect because it ties in with the laying too. When they start getting to the larger size eggs, you want them to be able to lay them with ease. They shouldn't struggle. They should just pop in the nest box, sit down, squeeze that egg out, and then go back to chickening. <laughs> Come out, give their little egg song, tell all their friends they found a cool place and they should do it over there, and then they're gone. My boys like to jump in and sit in the nest box and they will start singing the egg song too, and then they'll make a giant fuss over their selected spot where they want the girls to lay. Sometimes it's where I want them to be, and sometimes it's something they thought of on their own. It's that 300-gallon cattle waterer that we turned into a raised bed planter in the front yard, usually. Not in the next <laughs> box. Well, it's got the right elevation, the right soil yeah. consistency. They can uh, oh, nestle yeah. down in. On the other side of two different fences. Do they ever bury their eggs? No, I haven't seen that. Some of mine will start to bury them to prevent me from finding them, maybe. But we have very <laughs> gravelly soil, so that, that could be part of it. They really can't dig. But some of the other visual cues that's on our little list here, like Rip is big into aesthetic details. So he'll start looking at combs and stuff. And I was able to put that off for a couple of years while I worked on some other things. But when you are sitting and evaluating and looking at them, those little details of the standard traits of what makes a pretty and correct bird you can use that for a point to call off of one season because just one season can really make a big difference in combs and tails wing sets little things like that you can fix a lot in one season by making that the focus mandy that's really not where i was going with that but you've done good anyway now, what I was thinking about is when I look at a bird, let's say I've got a pen full of hens, I want to pick out the less productive birds and the more productive birds. I look for a bird that has a nice bright red comb. If I see a female in there whose comb is shrunken down and shriveled up and almost pale pink-like, that's not a bird that I want in my flock. Yeah, she's not going to be productive. No. And the same thing for the rest of the heads. Is her face bright red? Is the skin smooth or wattles? Are they bright red and smooth? If they're not, that's another check on the bad side of the line there. I I normally, at, you know, clear and bright in the eyes. Yes. It's a term that I see around. And if, if I go around and look, I can, you know, when you see it, you know, it. you go, 
oh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, if you go out and set and watch with your birds and see who's doing what, how perky and active they are, your leaders in the flock are going to be those vibrant, well-colored, active, vigorous birds. That's who you want. What about feather condition? Do you think that enters into uh, a bird's productivity or not? Definitely. I see that tracing all the way back to nutrition. They have access to the basic building blocks that they need. So they're going to have great plumage, which also means they should be producing great quality hatching eggs. And if they don't, it kind of gives light into that individual bird. Like if I come across one whose feathers just look unkempt, that means that bird isn't grooming itself that well, not compared to its peers. So then I kind of want to watch that one to see why it might not be keeping itself in the same sort of condition the others are. And that's enough reason, too, to drop that one off the list of contention. Exactly. Just for not taking care of itself that well. Or it could just be something as simple as feeder crowding or another hen guarding her off to feed. You never know. Which then goes into Watching your birds, know your birds. Their social structure. Do you want the eggs from the weakest link? The one that they don't, because flocks can kind of tell you who the calls are too. Just oh, how they, they self-select. Yeah, they'll self-select a bit themselves, which can get interesting when you watch their little dynamics and who's allowed to do what, who's in charge, the flock decisions they're making for themselves. Just watching that can be insightful. Another thing that I'll sort birds by is the color of their shank. And that doesn't work on all breeds. Mandy, you you raise birds with blue shanks, and some have white. But if you have a yellow shank bird, and all the birds are really into good heavy production, and you find one that has really bright yellow shanks or a bright yellow beak, chances are she's not laying very well. Really? Yeah, because over a period of time, those hens are taking that pigment that they've accumulated in their bodies and in their skin and in their shanks and using that in the production of eggs. And they'll start out bright yellow, and then over a period of time, it'll it'll gradually get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And lighter. I've seen, uh, I've had Rhode Island Reds should have yellow shanks, right? Well, I've yeah. had some old hens in, in heavy production that look just as white as snow almost. Yeah, all those carotenoid pigments, the the yellows, oranges, and red pigments that comes from the plants and algaes get stored there and then get depleted as needed. So would you want to look for that around like a year and a half old after their first year of production? They're going to start to fade. Yeah. Yeah. When they get, and again, this highlights the importance of a properly managed molt uh, because that's part of the stores that need to get rebuilt. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you talking Uh, about the big, big molt when they're about 18 months, 18 to 20 months? Yeah, that that is the hardest one. That's that's the real proving ground for me. A bird that makes it through that drops her feathers fast, loses the excess weight and then rebuilds and gets back into her laying prime. Yeah. Is that through a managed molt or just watching them as they go through it naturally without you changing anything to force them into the molt? I will wait until I see feathers start dropping naturally, and then they go on their crash diet and are angry with me for a couple of weeks. Yeah, but it's worth it. I'm coming around to that idea. I used to leave them to their own devices, but now I see the the value in helping them and then using it as another parameter for selection. Yeah, they may get mad, but they'll get over it. They They will. I had a predator event with some ermine last week. And I got to see oh, the yeah. inside of the cavity of a few birds and they, they have not come up on their first molt yet. And their abdominal fat was really quite heavy and thick because I want to study the carcass, the structure when I'm, even when I'm taking a chicken apart in the kitchen or on my kitchen table after it's cooked, I'm always looking at different pieces of it and making sure that it was good or not. Yeah, sometimes it takes me some extra time to actually get dinner on the plates because I'm looking at the bird. (laughs) Well, you know, we've been talking about things that are visual cues for culling birds. Let's, and and John kind of got started on this and then we 
got into that rabbit hole situation again. But let's talk about using our hands to evaluate our birds. Andalyn, you had a, a really wonderful post today over on the breast group. But man, I, I don't know of very many people that get into this hands-on evaluation of their birds like you do. And frankly, I think the way you do it is the way everybody should be doing it. It was a long time coming because I definitely didn't start off that way. But over time, especially after making that decision of going dual purpose, I started to see what really mattered in developing the flock towards those goals. And every time I've ever been disappointed in poultry, it's because it wasn't done in the breeding where I would have outwardly pretty birds. But then once you got in there and you started dressing them out, they were pretty scrawny. (laughs) And that hands-on evaluation is the only way to get past it and breed into something better. Well, you had the unique opportunity, we'll call it, to expand out, basically, a non-existing line and then select what, you know, you were looking for and then cull it back down. So you really opened up Pandora's box for quite a few generations. Well, I did. Oh, and it was expensive. It took so much space and time and resources just to see that through. And then I was not prepared for how many years it was going to take either. There, right. it, you can't fix that much in a single season and it has to compound on itself over time. Mm-hmm. So if you go out and you see your birds and you put your hands on them and you're disappointed, don't call the entire group and start over. Just find that one pair. That the one trio that does it better than any of the others in that flock and only hatch from them. Don't hatch from anybody else because a skinny bird is going to breed more skinny birds. Just find the ones that are incrementally just a little bit better than the others and put your focus on them. And remember, you're not going to make giant leaps forward. You're going to take smaller steps forward. And it's going to yes. take some time. It's not... It's not an instant gratification thing, this poultry breeding. It's not. You have to be in it for the long haul. Oh, we had to eat our fair share of two-pound birds before we got to four-pound birds. <laughs> Less leftovers that way. No, I'm kidding. Oh, well, you just count how many it takes to put in the crock pot. You know you've done good things when you only have to put one in the crock pot instead of three. John was talking about pelvic spread earlier and... He is so right. There's nothing worse than trying to eviscerate a bird and feel like you're sticking your hand in a pincushion almost. Not only is it unpleasant for us to do that, those kind of birds are not very productive birds when Correct. they're narrow, narrow bodies and all pinched together in the rear end. But what about, and Mandolin, you've probably processed enough birds that you have seen a little bit of a difference in the appearance of the bird's skin. Yeah, there's variations there, too. And that Mm -hmm. can sway by the breed, the particular bloodline, and then individuals within both categories. There's going to be some variation in there. And the difference is is not only the color of the skin, but the thickness of the skin and how hairy the skin is. I didn't know chickens could be hairy. but uh, (laughs) I've been out there with a little handheld blowtorch singeing off hairs on processing day. I, I, I can I keep still a little remember. quick start torch for that purpose. I, yeah. I, I can still remember my grandmother processing a bunch of old hens and she'd tie them up on the clothesline. And when she had them all plucked and eviscerated and all that, and then she'd wad up some newspaper, roll it up, set fire to one of them. She'd just go down there singeing all the hair off those hens. Oh, look, she made her own torch. Oh, yeah. That was, that was back in the good old days before there was such a thing. <laughs> Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Cornish cross were bred away from having any hair, so they don't have to do a singe. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. They pretty much yeah. don't even have feathers anymore. Well, their body's twice the size it should be, and they have the same allotment of feathers, so the coverage yeah. is just really poor. Yes. So, they, <laughs> so if you're raising Cornish cross out on pasture, it's incredibly important they are under shade all the time because they will get sunburned and can die from it. Oh, I bet they could. I never even thought of that. Oh, yeah. You bet you. We've talked about the pigment of the skin, and we've talked about the skin appearance and, and feather condition and all these other things. But what about 
if you're going through a, a, a bunch of females and you're trying to sort out productive birds versus non-productive birds, what should the vent look like? Well, how do we cover that without it sounding dirty? <laughs> well, I, I like to say it should look smooth and moist. Too. I like, you know, round, moist. If it looks all um, puckered up like a prune and, and kind of dry, she's not. Yeah, that's it. It's either dry uh, again, or dry. Again, it's one of these things. You know it when you see it. If you know your birds, I could flip a bird over and go, yeah, she's good. Or no, she's definitely not laying or having a problem with laying. Well, and um, because that rear pelvic spread is variable based on if they're an active lay or not. So if you pick up a female and she's got like that nice productive looking vent that looks like it's active and she'll probably also have a nice forefinger spread in between the pelvic bones versus the dried up shriveled looking poop shoot, it's probably going to have maybe two fingers, maybe three in width. Also, when the egg's being laid, you know, listening for any signs of stress or strain, or do they just drop it and move on? And looking at the condition of your eggs, if you start seeing streaking on your eggs, you know, it's time to start looking at the structure of the hen that laid it. Do you mean streaking like a blood smear or streaking like a shell texture variation? Because sometimes, like, there was one female, I end up finding her and calling her out. Because while she was regu laying regularly, the egg was poor quality. And even though it came every day, there was a weirdness to the shape, almost like maybe her organs weren't where they were supposed to be on the inside, causing an indent and a flat side on the egg. Maybe it wasn't yeah. spinning in the chute correctly. Maybe I don't know what wasn't happening correctly, but it was a very incorrect egg that became consistent. So yeah. like what? consistently poor laying, I'll go find that bird and remove her from the flock. That's the uh, common flaw in my flock. And it came from my breeder that way. And when I got my birds from them, they very specifically said the torpedo shaped eggs. Oh yeah, set. that's a deal breaker too. I mean, they're beautiful. They're like 70, 72 grams and just great. But they're like they're really weird long torpedo narrow. shape. They're the weird torpedo shape. And we're like, you know, we're just, they're adamant that that doesn't move forward. And I agree. They're traditionally my heaviest and single yokers at the same time. Oh, heartbreaking. I know. It is. It is. Now, is that when they're in the middle of peak production or later uh -huh. on? Because sometimes yeah. I'll see it in my older birds. Their eggs will take up a torpedo shape, but they weren't that way the first year. It was no, like a second first third year. year. And okay. that was specific to my first year. That's part of my selection criteria moving forward on my breeding stock. If they're, I've already gotten rid of any of the torpedo shaped layers. They're with a friend of mine a couple of miles okay. away, and they're just producing fantastically for their farm stand and store. If they're too long, they don't fit a carton that well. But usually if mine outsize the egg carton, it's also a double yolk. People like that. And I know, that. and they get so spoiled. She's got an eight-year-old daughter who just gives them so much love. That's, that, that's, that, that, that's her aspect of the business. She take, collects the eggs and that goes into her. Uh, John and Mandy, I, I know your, your thoughts and your position on this, but I, I want to throw this out here. What about the amount of body fleshing? Is that a good indication of production or uh, is it something we should even worry about? So going into this, I was always told that heavyweight birds are going to be poor layers. But come to find out <laughs> that poor producers are obese. They're fat. They have limitations on what they can do because of their condition being obese. But in sharp contrast, you can have a very meaty, meaty bird that is still fairly lean, who is productive as all get out. They're allowed to be meaty. Meatiness is not the problem. It's obesity and fat that's the problem. That's where I've ended up. <laughs> as long as you have the carcass size to accommodate all the necessary functions, you know, the structure that makes it. Yeah, the bird. inner capacity. Ultimately, I look at feed conversion ratio. How much feed did this bird eat? To how much flesh did she or he provide? To me, that's important. And, you know, age is a variable that 
throws everything off because obviously I've kept this bird around for two or three years and fed it a lot more food. But what would it have, what would have been the feed conversion ratio at 20 weeks? Yeah, that's important to know. Thank you for joining us this week. And before you go, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released and they're released every Tuesday. And if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd like to ask you to drop us an email at poultrykeeperspodcast at gmail.com and share your thoughts about the show. So thank you for joining us for this episode of the Poultry Keepers Podcast. We'll see you next week.